Hey comic fans, welcome back. Dave here at Ground Zero helping you with Pass the Time with a segment we're still calling. Okay, Josh Herndon writes us again and says, Hey Dave, I've always been curious about the Fawcett and Charlton cast of characters, how their companies folded and how they wound up at DC. Well, Josh, that's a pretty tall order. And I could spend a lot of time because both of them are pretty complex stories. But I'm going to tackle half your question today because Fawcett Publications is one of my favorite comic book publishers of the Golden Age. And their lead superhero, Captain Marvel, is still my favorite superhero of them all. Now, Fawcett Publications was founded by William Fawcett in 1919 with a book of off-color jokes that he called Captain Billy's Whiz Bang. This gave him enough money to invest in a really good stable of magazines. Family Circle, Mechanics Illustrated, True Confessions started selling up to 2 million copies an issue. But almost by the time the 30s rolled around, this was a very respectable publishing house. Not at all like a lot of the other 2-bit publishers that were popular during the era and certainly busy in the comic book market. Now by the time we get to late 1939, Fawcett Publications had decided to enter the comic book market, and they did so with Wiz Comics number no. two. Why number two, you ask? Well, because they kept trying all these different titles, but somebody would beat them to the punch. It was originally going to be called Flash Comics, but All American Comics had beat them to it. Then they tried Thrill Comics, but another publisher had already trademarked the name. So when they finally landed on Wiz, they rushed out an ash can with non original material just to get the copyright secured. So the first book to actually hit the stands with all original material was Wiz Comics number no. 2, and it featured their new flagship superhero, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel was created by Bill Parker and C.C. Beck, with a little help from William Fawcett's youngest son, Roscoe. Roscoe worked in the family business in circulation, and he had seen a survey talking about this great new field of comics, and that most of their readers were 10 to 12-year-old boys. So he told his creators, I want a Superman-like character, but somebody that in his secret identity is a 10 to 12 year old boy. Now they came up with orphan newsboy Billy Batson, who's lured into a mystic subway and transported to the Rock of Eternity, where he meets the creepy wizard Shazam, who grants him all these powers of six ancient Greek gods, Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, Mercury. It's pretty awesome, and it's a pretty big hit right away. Released in December of 1939 with a cover date of February 1940, right out of the box, everybody loves Captain Marvel. Now, I'm actually going to rewind about six months. Because in 1938, Superman hit the stands, and it was such a huge instant success that every two-bit publisher out there wanted a piece of that action. So much so, they were all rushing to beat each other to the stands. Every one of them wanted to be the first, to be second. And the winner of that was this little gem from Fox Publications. Now, Fox Publications was the outfit of Victor Fox. You've heard his name before. I talked about him yesterday. He was a crooked, kind of shady, two-bit publisher who was always ready to jump on a quick trend. In this case, it was superheroes. And his entry into the market was Wonder Man. Now, Wonder Man possessed super strength. Super speed, super stamina, extra sensory powers, invulnerability, and flight. Gee, does that sound like anybody we know? Well, it did to DC. They promptly sued them and just as promptly won their lawsuit. And Wonder Man only lasted one issue. Yes, he was a one-hit wonder. But this emboldened DC. Now that brings us to Captain Marvel, because Wiz Comics came out of the gate and was doing really, really well. DC could not help but notice this, and emboldened by their success in the Wonder Man lawsuit, also decided to sue Fawcett Publications. They filed their lawsuit in 1941, but it wasn't actually going to go to court for several years. In the meantime, Captain Marvel just continued to get more and more and more popular, spawning its own book, Captain Marvel Adventures, which was published twice a month. It was published every other week, and even with that frequent publication schedule, was selling 1.3 million copies an issue. It was the best-selling comic book on the stands, outselling Batman, outselling the Justice Society, Flash, but most infuriating for DC, outselling Superman. 
This made DC really unhappy. And even more unhappy, 1941 Republic Pictures wanted to enter the superhero market themselves, and they approached DC about a live action film featuring Superman. DC was all for this. But there was a snag. They had already licensed Superman character out to Paramount for their series of immortal Max Fleischer Superman cartoons. And guys, if you haven't seen all the Max Fleischer Superman cartoons, watch them now while you're off. They are great. They are a must see for any fan of comics. But this snag meant that there was not necessarily a clear right to the character that they could license, so Republic Pictures immediately turned to Fawcett Publications and instead released The Adventures of Captain Marvel in a 12-part serial. This serial not only makes Captain Marvel the first superhero in a live action appearance, it's actually really, really good. It's one of the best ser movie serials of all time. So another thing, if you get a chance, this is one to watch. Meanwhile, on the publishing end, Fawcett just continued to grow and grow and grow. Their Marvel family was still their most popular. They added Captain Marvel Jr. to the mix. Uh, and then after that, they added Mary Marvel, making the Marvel family complete. And then ultimately, they got their own series. Um, why was the Marvel family so popular? It's, well, really, when you get right down to it, Captain Marvel himself was dumb as a brick. Honestly, every single villain out there outwitted Captain Marvel at every turn, every single time. That was largely their plot device. Honestly, he should have got a refund on that first S of his name because the wisdom of Solomon did not do much for him. But dumb as a brick though he might have been, the stories themselves were charming. They were imaginatively whimsical and kids just seemed to love this. They had a talking tiger as their best friend. They traveled in time. They fought fairy tale monsters. One of, one of their prime villains was a worm. This was what kids needed. And honestly, they spent most of their time fighting the world's wickedest scientist, Dr. Savannah, who himself was an evil, bald scientist. Again, might sound a little bit familiar. Now, in addition to these, Fawcett published a large stable of comic book characters and did pretty well with all of them. After the Marvel family, their next most popular characters were these two. Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. Yeah, I know. I'm going to stop here and let you guys make your own joke. Okay? You done? Okay, good. Bullet Man and Bullet Girl, though, are instrumental in the Fawcett universe. And frankly, they were insanely popular back in those days. But the, but the books didn't stop there. They also had Spy Smasher. They had Don Winslow of the Navy, Ibis the Invincible. They released a lot of Western comics, including Gene Autry comics. So they were doing really well for the 40s while the Golden Age was going. Now, the, the lawsuit case comes to court in 1948, March, actually. And for that particular case, Fawcett actually wins. Or really, more accurately, DC loses. Because it turns out DC had licensed the Superman character to a newspaper syndicate for a daily newspaper strip. And on some of the episodes of that strip, they had in inadvertently left off the copyright DC Comics tag. So Fawcett argued without those on the tag, they had foregone their light rights to the Superman copyright. The judge agreed. So the judge ruled against DC. Even though in his opinion, he said Captain Marvel was a copyright infraction of Superman. Well, because he said that in his opinion, DC immediately appealed, and that case went to court in 1951. It went to the United States Court of Appeals of the Second Circuit under the famed judge, Learned Hand. Truth is always stranger than fiction. Honestly, if you study law, you will study some of the cases presided over by Judge Learned Hand. Well, this time, the judge ruled in DC's favor. But he kind of did it in a backhanded way. He said that Captain Marvel himself was not a copyright infringement, but that some of his abilities were and some of the situations in some of his stories were. And so for that, he was going to kick it back to a lower court so they could go through and decide just exactly how much damages Fawcett was going to owe. Well, by this point, it was the 50s. The Golden Age was over. Superheroes weren't nearly as popular as they had been. Comic sales while still doing okay, were nothing like what they had been through its prime period. So Fawcett was tired of fighting this lawsuit, and they decided just simply to settle out of court. So they agreed to give DC $400,000 in damages, and also to agree to never, 
ever publish Captain Marvel or any of the Captain Marvel family of characters again. In this case, DC irrevocably pretty much won. Now, this had a chilling effect on superhero comics. Now, through the 50s, people really weren't doing superhero comics. They were putting out westerns, they were putting out science fiction books, but all at a much lower sales level. We wouldn't see a revival in superheroes until the 60s. But when we did, they were all very keenly aware of the effect of DC's success with their lawsuits. This is why when Marvel did Spider-Man, they hyphenated the name so that it wouldn't look too much like Superman. This is why none of the early original Marvel characters flew under their own power. Hulk leapt from place to place with his mighty legs. Spider-Man swung from building to building on his web. Um, Thor, you're probably saying, surely Thor flew. Not under his own power. Thor simply spun his hammer around, threw it, and but then just as it was flying away, grabbed the back of its handle and let it carry him along. Okay, it's contrived, but it works. And they did all this because they were afraid of looking too much like the DC characters. Now, also, in effect from this. Over in Britain, L. Miller and Sons was publishing black and white reprints of the Captain Marvel and Marvel family stories, and they were incredibly popular in Great Britain. But after the lawsuit, those stories stopped coming. So they finally decided to make their own. And so they basically kept things going in the same style that they had been, just with British writers and British artists under the name Marvel Man. That will come back to play in just a little bit. Now, in the interim, a few other publishers had decided to start their own Captain Marvel book. The most unusual of these is this one from MLB Publications called Captain Marvel. What was his power, you ask? Well, you'll be happy to know it didn't infringe on Superman's powers at all. His powers were when he would go to fight villains, he would shout, split, and his arms and legs and sometimes his head would fly off his body. You can't make this stuff up, people. By the time 1967 rolled around, Marvel Comics realized, guys, we're Marvel Comics. Why don't we have a Marvel Captain Marvel? So they came up with their own character, Captain Marvel, the, the Kree warrior Marvel. Oddly, this was actually one of their lowest selling superhero titles. They barely kept it going and they did all sorts of changes throughout the years, trying to find some form to make it work. But they were determined to keep him going no matter what, just so they could keep, keep hold of the copyright of the character. And that comes into play because finally, in 1972, DC comes back into play. The publisher of the company at the time, Carmen Infantino, was looking for new properties to make comic books. And he went to Fawcett Publications, who at this point was only publishing magazines, and said, Hey guys, how about if we license your characters? Now I know what you're thinking. Why didn't Fawcett tell him, Guys, you sued us out of business for those characters. Go jump in a lake. Why did they not tell them that? Money. Why not? It was money on characters that they weren't doing anything with, that they couldn't do anything with. So they licensed the characters to DC, and DC set about creating their own Captain Marvel comic book. But because Marvel Comics had their own Captain Marvel comic book, they couldn't call the book itself Captain Marvel. And they came up with the name Shazam. Now, they put in the title Shazam, the original Captain Marvel. That didn't last very long because Marvel saw that and said, we will sue you, you cannot do this. Marvel appreciated no irony whatsoever here. So eventually they changed it to Shazam, the world's mightiest mortal. And it was published for a good handful of years, but never terribly successful. Now they got the original artist C.C. Beck on board, and he worked on the book for quite a while, but he really did not like it. He hated it, because Captain Marvel was still dumb as a brick. But in this case, they had lost the whimsy and the imagination that had made those 40 stories for Fawcett so wonderful. So he eventually quit the book, and DC just had no idea what to do with this title. Uh, they tried having him fight Superman. They tried having the Justice League visit Earth-S. Now this one was actually really good because they get to meet Ibis the Invincible and Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. But they tried all these things, but Captain Marvel just never really took off. The only thing that kept it from really just being flushed down the toilet was a live action TV show on Saturday morning called Shazam. Now, this show was actually pretty popular, and so even though the book itself was low-selling, DC kept it going because this kept the character just popular enough that people wanted something to do with it. Uh, that kept it going up through about 77. The TV show went from 74 to 77. After this point, DC just floundered. They had no idea what to do with it. 
Meanwhile, the 80s come along and a lot of small publishers enter the market competing against Marvel and DC. One of those, Eclipse Comics, realizes, hey, these Marvel Man adventures over in Britain, a lot of them were written by Alan Moore and a lot of them were really, really good. So they go to Miller and Sons and license it for over in the States. And Marvel says, nuh-uh, you cannot call it Marvel Man. We own the world word Marvel. To which Eclipse says, guys, you can't own the word Marvel. Besides, we're publishing adventures of a character that was created before Marvel Comics even existed. To which Marvel Comics said, we're bigger than you guys. And Eclipse relented and decided instead to call the series Miracle Man. Now, Miracle Man has its own winding, torturous history, and that could be another 30-minute program, but, but we're going to leave that one for now and go to the next time that it actually started to become good again, because DC turned the series over with another try to Jerry Ordway, and he came up with The Power of Shazam. The Power of Shazam, they finally get it right. This takes place, even though it's in regular DC continuity, it takes place in Fawcett City. Fawcett City is a city oddly out of time, and, and that way they're able to work in a lot of the cool characters that made Fawcett Comics unique. Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. Spy Smasher, they all show up in this series. And while it doesn't last terribly long, it lasts, I believe, for 47 issues, it's a really good series and one you should definitely check out. Uh, also, kind of close to this time, by 1991, Alex Ross had done his own tribute to Captain Marvel, Shazam! The Power of Hope. This was a fully painted prestige format book, also really, really good, really, really reverent of what made Captain Marvel special. That brings us up to where DC starts to screw it up again, because when the New 52 came along, they finally decided, okay, enough. We can't call him Captain Marvel. We're just going to call him Shazam. And I guess that's probably the best thing to do because at, at this point, it's just too confusing. Is he Shazam? Is he Captain Marvel? What's the deal? Who knows? Well, now, by that point, Marvel Comics gets the right to the old Marvel Man publishing series because Eclipse Comics is out of business. And when Marvel does that... Sorry, I dropped it on the floor. When Marvel does that, they say, forget Miracle Man. You know, really, Marvel Man, that's a good title. So they come out with Marvel Man. And that brings us up pretty well to present. Now, what's good reading for these books? Well, personally, Jeff Johns did a really nice take on the series. And this is a really good book. You'll find it's a lot like the movie that's just come out. But, but, but it's, it's actually excellent. For classic Captain Marvel adventures, we've got from DC, the greatest Captain Marvel stories ever told. It's quite good. It gives you a good taste of Captain Marvel stories from different eras, as does Shazam, a celebration of 75 years. Uh, Jeff Smith, the guy who did Bone, and Bone also is a must read. He took his own take on Captain Marvel with Shazam, the Monster Society of Evil. All of these are pretty solid books. But the best thing, really, the best thing to do is to go back, if at all possible, and read the classic 40s adventures, because those are really where Shazam just soared. And then, of course, there's the Shazam movie that hit last year. And frankly, I thought it did a really good job. Zachary Levi is the perfect guy to play this character. Interestingly enough, though, it comes full circle, because this puts him on the movie screens as he was the first superhero character to be on the silver screen. This time, though, he had competition from Captain Marvel. That's it, guys. Guys, remember, remember the three S's. Like, share, subscribe. And I know it's not three S's, but two S's and an L just doesn't sound as cool. Remember the three S's, and guys, take care of yourself. Wash your hands. Stay at home if you possibly can. I'll be back hopefully tomorrow. Guys, thanks so much. Take care.